Hi and welcome to P's and G's Online. It's lovely that you can join us. Uh, in the book of Zechariah that we are going through just now, uh, it very much points forward to the new creation and the heavenly Jerusalem and the heavenly city that God is preparing for his people. And our prayer is that we might get a glimpse and a foretaste of what eternity really could mean for you and for me. So as we think about what God's going to say to us today, let's pray. Father, thank you that you promise something far better and richer and bigger and more expansive than we can ever dream. That you are restoring all things to yourself. And we pray that we might hear your voice speaking clearly to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
God, thank you that you are so good to us. We take it real seriously when we say that who can stop the Lord Almighty? We recognize that you are bigger and that you are greater than all the circumstances, all the issues that present themselves in front of us, all the reasons that we use to avoid you or to run from you, to resist your grace. So just, just now, Lord, we choose to just lay some of that down. We ask that your goodness would just get inside us an inch more, Lord. That we get past the reasons that we come up not to follow you or not to, to follow the call you put on our lives. We just thank you for your goodness and we celebrate it just now. We celebrate that you gave us life, you give us air to breathe. You gave us each other, the church and community, you give us life, God. You are so good. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, you're good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh. Song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good. You're never gonna let me down Oh, you know 
You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, you're good. Each week we've been hearing from different members of P's and G's as to how life is for them just now. And this week uh, Libby caught up with Joe Shanks, uh, who's been going through a series of changes over the last two or three years, and just uh, asked her a few questions about where she's found God in some of the good times as well as the hard times. Over to you, Libby. Well, it's uh, great to be here with Jo Grattan-Shanks uh, today. And uh, she's just going to be sharing a little bit about uh, what's been happening in her life because lots of us have faced real challenges over the last 18 m- months because of COVID and some of the fallout of that on our lives. Uh, but Jo, you have really had a really challenging um, last 18 months, two years. Do you want to just share with us a little bit about what's been happening in yours and your family's life? Uh, Yeah, so I'm married to David Shanks. He works in the office. Uh, You'll know him very well. And um, I study speech and language therapy. And we have a little girl called Ayla who is seven months old. Um, I'm originally from Inverness and that's where my parents lived. And in September 2019, my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer, um, which came as just a total shock. Um, He'd always been really fit and healthy. um, And he had just started, I think it was his second round of um, chemo, at the sort of, in October, when my mum became really unwell and she was taken to hospital in Inverness and they diagnosed her with an aortic aneurysm that needed sort of immediate surgery. So she was flown to Edinburgh um, for the operation and she was in intensive care for two weeks, but um, there was complications and she died. Um, And so that was just so unexpected. Um, And also I think we had our minds sort of focused on my dad and what he was going to be going through so for to suddenly lose my mum was just a bit unbelievable um so my dad um went on to have his third round of chemo but they found it wasn't making any difference to the cancer and that just the side effects were so severe that he ended up with blood clots and things it wasn't worth it so they decided to stop his treatment um and just kind of do palliative care from there. Um, Obviously 2020 was a weird year for lots of people, but um, it was particularly strange for us. We sort of spent it living between Inverness and Edinburgh um, because we were looking after my dad in Inverness. Um, David was working remotely. I was doing like 
the odd uni essay every so often and we found out we were expecting our baby. Um, and so I had my maternity care in Edinburgh, so we kind of, we travelled up and down the A9 a lot. Um, and then in September last year, my dad died. Um, and about a month later, at the end of October, um, our little girl was born, Ayla was born. Um, we had her in Inverness. And then when she was about two weeks old, we travelled back to Edinburgh. Um, yeah, and then right into sort of second lockdown. Um, and having a newborn in lockdown is a whole other kettle of fish as well. So it's been quite intense. A little intense. Mm. That is quite a, an 18 months that you've had uh, by anybody's estimations. But, you know, you're in your mid-20s. Uh, and you're an only child, so you haven't got other brothers and sisters to go through all that with, and you've lost your mum in really tragic circumstances, and then your dad, and sort of going through the devastation of grief in the middle of lockdown uh, without everybody around you supporting you. And then you found out you're pregnant, which is a joy and a delight as well, And but going through all that whilst um, helping your dad through his final stages of life as well. And... It, just watching you go through some of that, I think one of the things that struck me is that as much as you were facing and dealing with real tragedy and real grief for yourself, there was a real strength there as well. Can you just talk a bit about um, where that strength, where you found strength to keep going through that year? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, I think sometimes I don't really know. Um, in the space of six weeks, my whole world fell apart. But Ultimately, for me, like God has been an anchor, and more than that, God has been in the people around me. Um, he's placed incredible people in my life, and um, they have been His hands and His feet. You know, from people bringing us meals to traveling so much, such distance to the prayer sort of said over our family. Um, and like, I wouldn't have got through any of this without David. Like he's shown me God's love, his compassion, his sort of strength. And then towards the end of my dad's life and the second lockdown, Ayla has brought us such joy and celebration. And that's mm. been such a sort of tender mm. gift. Um, and that's probably, yeah, what's kept me going is, yeah, the people who have, who have been Jesus to us. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, you found strength um, from God and through the people around you and the sort of practical ways that you've experienced uh, God's love over the last year. But in those moments, which I'm sure there were many of, where you woke up in the morning and you were just overwhelmed by grief and uh, the sort of desolation of what you've been through, uh, where have you found the hope to just keep going, to keep putting one step, one foot in front of the other each day? Um, well, I don't want to pretend like I've been okay. You know, I've fallen apart a thousand times on this sort of last 18 months and I've cried and I've doubted and I've been really mad at God and so so sad um, and we never also anticipated having a baby in a pandemic mm. you know like mm. we always thought we would have our village around us I didn't ever think I'd parent without my own parents um, but my hope is you know, is come from, I had these verses um, right at the start. So dwell in hope and um, be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead. And I sat in the hope that Ayla has brought us in the hope of my baby and in the hope that my mum and dad are reunited and with God. Um, that is probably what has brought me through um, and the 
you know, grief doesn't go away. Grief will last as long as my love for my parents um, exists. And that's okay. Like, I've learned that grief and joy, they coexist and they don't make one less. They just make them different. Um, yeah. That's so true. What can we pray for you? Um, well, I'm going back to uni mm -hmm. in September, which is just a, a change um, to sort of leave Ayla for longer than about half an hour will be mm -hmm. a strange experience. Um, so for that to go smoothly, both like that I can study and get through this last year, but she will be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, probably also that um, there's lots of sort of paperwork that comes mm -hmm. with death and um, like my parents' house, we have to sort that. We're going to do that in July. Um, yeah, that that would be as untraumatic as possible. Um, and lastly, more generally, just that like everything we've gone through as a nation mm. with COVID, it would give us all a better understanding of things like grief and mm. death and mm. mental health and that we can all be there for each other more. Mm. Brilliant. Well, let's pray. Let's pray for Joe and David. Father God, I just um, thank you for holding Joe so close to you over the last 18 months and the really difficult times that she and her family have experienced. Thank you for her parents and all that they uh, brought to her, the way that they've loved her and showed her life and, and showed her love. And as she continues to grieve, um, help her to hold on to the memories. To be able to keep that balance of grief and joy that she's spoken of. We thank you for the gift of Ayla uh, to Joe and David. And we pray for her as she continues to grow and thrive. And pray for them as parents as well, that you give them um, everything that they need. Patience and kindness and compassion and joy and abounding love for her. And we pray for those uh, practical things uh, that Joe's spoken of. Uh, we pray that the organising of the house and sorting all that through would go well and all the paperwork and would be straightforward and not as traumatic as it could be. We pray for Joe as she goes back to university to complete her final year in September. Um, that Lord, you would help Ayla to settle uh, without Joe and Joe would feel really confident going back and completing her studies. And I pray that would be really life-giving uh, for her and for David and for Ayla as well. And it would add something new to their family life. We just thank you that we can have hope in you and that despite the really traumatic things that sometimes life throws at us, that we can hold on to you knowing that you are our strength. There is hope beyond this life in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our passage that we'll hear read in a few moments, the Lord entreats Zechariah and the people to administer true justice and to show compassion and mercy to one another. Justice, mercy and compassion. Three characteristics that as followers of Jesus, we're called to embody ourselves and to pray for. And so we're going to use these three things, justice, mercy and compassion as the basis for our prayers today. So let's pray. God of justice, we continue to pray for the response in the UK and across the world to the COVID pandemic. We pray that leaders will come together and commit to a truly global and humanitarian response. That vaccines wouldn't be hoarded by rich countries, but all resources would be distributed equally and fairly. God of justice, we continue to pray for political leaders across the UK who have stepped forward to challenge the cuts to the UK aid budget. We pray that their voice will be heard, that change will come, 
and you would make a way for this aid to be reinstated. And Lord, open our eyes to recognise and respond to the injustice which is all around us. Give us courage and wisdom this week to speak and act justly in your name, in our workplaces, in our families or communities, to stand alongside the oppressed, to be a voice for the voiceless, to use our freedom to release those who are bound. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, every day we experience your forgiveness and your mercy in our lives. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us. And we pray, Lord, for those who have yet to recognise and respond to your mercy. For those who have wandered away from you. For those who have decided they don't want to know. For those who have been taken in by the false promises of the world. In a moment of quiet, why don't you picture in your mind a part of your city or area, your school or college, your workplace, or an individual who you long to know the mercy and love of Jesus in their lives? And as you picture this person or place, simply pray, Lord, have mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we know that you hear the cries of all who are distressed and hurting. And so we pray for ourselves or those known to us who are grieving, who are struggling in relationships, who are facing challenges with our work, who are lonely or feeling without purpose, who are battling ill health, who are hurting in some way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Libby. Well, today we're continuing our series going through the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament. And today's passage is Zechariah chapter 7, which is going to be read for us by Will Huxtable, after which Paul is going to speak for us. Today's reading is Zechariah chapter 7. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev. The people of Bethel had sent Shereza and Rejan Melech, together with their men, to entreat the Lord by asking the priests of the house of the Lord Almighty and the prophets, Should I mourn and fast in the fifth month, as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Ask all the people of the land and the priests. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous? and the Negev and the western foothills were settled. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention Stubbornly they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations where they were strangers. The land they left behind them was so desolate that no one travelled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. Thank you, Will, for the reading. A friend of mine recently was on his way to work and he bought two coffees, one for himself and one for his wife. And as he turned the corner to go around to deliver the coffees, 
He saw a man that was sat on the pavement on the floor. Looked like he'd possibly been there all night. He was asking for money and he was in a bit of a bad state. And as my friend walked by him, something began to move and tug on his heartstrings. And my friend turned to the guy that was on the street and he just very nicely, very politely and kindly said, hey, would you like a coffee too? To which the guy on the street said, well, no, I'd love a hot chocolate. So my friend went back around the corner, queued up back into the shop and bought this guy a hot chocolate. He came round to deliver the hot chocolate to the guy and, and placed it down before him. And as he did, I think his sleeve maybe come up. And the guy on the street noticed a tattoo of a cross on his arm. And the guy on the street said, oh, are you a Christian? And my friend was like, uh, yeah. And he said, would you pray for me? And my friend, who hadn't been a Christian very long and maybe kind of not in this situation before, was like, um, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, I'll, 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 remember, I'll remember to pray for you. And the guy said, no, 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 will you pray for me now? So right there and then on the busy streets in Edinburgh, my friend was able to connect with this guy in over hot chocolate and coffee. He was able to look him in the eye, notice him, see him. He was able to care for him. He was able to actually pray for him there and then on the street. What I love about that situation is I love the heart behind it. See, my friend wasn't telling me that to brag. He wasn't telling me that he was doing it because he thought he should do it, that it was the right thing to do out of tradition, out of ritual or anything like that. He genuinely loved the opportunity to serve and to pray for the guy on the street. And more than that, he said, I hope I said the right things. I hope I prayed the right things. I love that the guy, knowing that he was a Christian, was able to ask of the church, ask of the Christian to, to care, to pray for him there and then. But I love that my friend had the time. My friend had the time to actually see the person. Often we can walk in such a fast pace. We can be lost in our head that often we don't even see. I love that my friend had time to see the person, to notice the person, and it was safe and appropriate for him to engage and to do that, and he, he did it in such a loving way. I love that my friend had the time to go back into the coffee shop to queue up again, to buy the hot chocolate. And I love that my friend had the time to pray for this guy in need. I love that my friend remembered the poor. If you've been following us and tracking where we are, we've been looking at these minor prophets. We've been looking at Haggai and now we're looking at Zechariah. And Zechariah is one of the minor prophets. Uh, and here in verse 2, he's approached by some people from Bethel. Bethel was a town 12 miles north of Jerusalem. Uh, and it was typically known as, as a worship centre, a place where people would worship and pray. But these people have travelled uh, and they've got a question that's burning. And they approach uh, Zechariah with this question. Verse 3. Should I mourn and fast? In the fifth month, as I have done for so many years. And this passage is really his response is a patchwork quilt of Zachariah's thoughts and Zachariah's theology. Some commentaries describe this response that Zachariah gives as almost being like a sermon. And if the sermon was summarized in a nutshell, it would be this. Don't be like your ancestors who didn't listen but remember to love upon the poor around you. There you go, that's it, that's probably my talk done. Um, no, there's a bit more to it than that, but that's it at a nutshell, at the heart. Don't be like your ancestors who didn't listen, but love upon the poor that's around you. Andrew Hill in his commentary says this, the prophet's response questions the motive of the people participating in ritual fasting. It's generally known as a rebuke. This passage that Will's read out is basically the Lord speaking through Zechariah and he's challenging the people. He's challenging their hearts, their motives. He's asking a question behind the question. As often Jesus did, Zechariah he's saying, let me ask you a deeper question. You've come to me about rit rituals and fasting, but let me ask you a deeper question. What's the heart behind it? Why do you do what you do. Zachariah is wanting them to step back and look at their heart. Through Zachariah, God is warning them not to be like their parents or their forefathers who didn't listen to the prophets of their time, inviting them and asking them to listen to God and to respond and to care for those on the margins, those who are in need. 
Let's look at verse five and six then, because this rhetorical question basically says, through uh, God, Zachariah is saying, uh, through Zachariah, God is saying this, sorry. Is your fasting really for me? Is your fasting really of God? And the answer to that question that the Lord pauses through Zachariah is no, certainly not. Their fasting lacks sincerity. It's self-seeking. Their forefathers fail to listen and they fail to act as well. They may be made excuses. And God's warning them through Zechariah, don't be like them. Don't do that. Don't close your ears. Don't close your hearts. But listen, don't make excuses for what I'm wanting you to do. It's really interesting. Uh, one of, um, we've got four children. One of our uh, child's going through this interesting phase. And uh, when we ask them to do something, they come back at us with, yeah, but, but this. Or yeah, but, but, but that. Can you just do this? But yeah, but, but, but. And, and, and that's the season they're in. That's, that's understandably their children. But they've moved into this new chapter, this new season, this new response. And to my delight uh, and, and pleasure, the response now is, yeah, sure. Not, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. Like, we ask you to do something like, yeah, sure. Now, I obviously still love the child when the answer is, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. But it's such a delight when the response is, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I've heard you, I'm listening, I'm obedient, I'll do that. It's so nice, I'm sure some of you parents might be able to connect with that. You know, as, as a church, we're in this time of listening to God. We're in this time of discerning and weighing up thoughts and having emails come in, words and pictures and scripture verses of just God and what he might be saying at this time. We continue to be a church that sticks to making whole life disciples, sharing the whole of the gospel with the whole of society through churches of grace. But we have an amazing opportunity to continue to listen to God in this time, what God might be saying to us and speaking to us about. Well, what was God speaking to the people uh, of Zechariah's time? Well, Dave said uh, last week that if Haggai was talking about rebuilding the temple, Zechariah is talking about rebuilding relationships, their relationship with God, but also to others on the margins, the poor, the, the ones that they may have forgotten at this time. It's a reminder, it's a call back to care for those in need. And the Old Testament is filled with stuff like this, isn't it? Think about Isaiah 58, verse 6. It says, is it not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the, to untie the codes, cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? Think about Micah 6 verse 8, the instructions for us to act justly, love mercy and walk humbly before our God. Jesus himself quotes Isaiah and he says, I've come to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring good news to the poor. James 1 verse 28 says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphan and widow in distress. For me, this passage that Will just read out, it reveals God's heart. He sees the rituals that they do, he sees the fasting that they do, but he wants to go beyond that and he wants to get to the heart of it. And he wants to say, why do you do what you do? And beyond that, do you care for those that you see? Do you have eyes to see? Do you have time to see people? It starts with a question, should I do this? And it ends with an answer, do you do this? Verse 9 and 10 says this, this is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. It's an encouragement to see, it's, it's so encouraging, sorry, to, to see expressions of that happen here at the church. Was being able to administer some of them key things that's mentioned in Zachariah there. Think about the Saturday meal that we're able to provide for people with all the restrictions and so on that we have to uh, adhere to. But being able to provide food and conversation and some essentials for people, journeying with them. Caring for those on the margins. We've just finished a befriending course, some, some training to work out how do we get some of the guests that we meet on a Saturday 
from A to B? How do we walk and journey with them? How do we take them beyond the meal, beyond the food? We've recently set up a group of people who are going to oversee uh, a real uh, landing pad for some of the people who are arriving from Hong Kong. Thousands of people that are going to be arriving uh, in the UK from Hong Kong. How do we care for them, for the stranger in a strange land? How do we look after them? How do we love upon them? Think about our pastoral care and counselling. Some of the things that are on God's heart. And obviously we all need help from time to time. We all need support and care. We all are poor in spirit, poor emotionally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially at times. And all of us are in that situation. Some people are in extreme situations that we see. But we engage with this sort of stuff. We do this sort of stuff, not to gain salvation, as we know, not to gain acceptance from God, but we're compelled by him. We're working with him, acting out of who we are and who we've been made to be. Supporting one another and learning from one another. Journeying with each other. Loving the people that's right in front of us. Remembering the poor. I'm sure you're aware of this, um, this phrase and this practice in the Old Testament called gleaning. Gleaning is basically the act of collecting leftover crops from generous farmers. That it, it would leave a, a, a fringe on the margin, some crops that they wouldn't harvest, but they would leave for the people who were poor. The people that needed it. And they would come and they would collect it all up. It's a generous act. And it's indeed how Ruth and Boaz uh, met in the Old Testament. Ruth and Boaz. Ruth uh, was collecting this that was left over by Boaz, a wealthy farmer. They met. They fall in love. And this begins the birth line of Jesus. It's this generosity that gives way to Jesus. We're encouraged here to have open ears, not to have closed hearts, not to have hard hearts. Zechariah is warning the people to have open ears, to listen and to see the people that are around us, the people who are at need, the people who need to be loved upon in Jesus' name. So for us personally, we may want to say again, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. We may want to say, Lord, show me how to serve where it's safe and appropriate to do so. How can I engage how can I sort, serve and where? I've been asking that of myself. Asking, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me? How can I get involved? And I'll just end with a story. I was on my way back from recording a talk at church, just like I'm doing now. And I'd walked back from the city. I was walking home and I was walking along the promenade and I was listening to worship music and all was well with the world. I was walking home to have lunch with my wife. And as I walked past um, the promenade, I saw a man he was sat on a bench just looking out to sea. And to be honest, I, I carried on walking, but something tugged in my heartstrings. Maybe it was the Lord, maybe it was a reminder to remember the poor. I don't know what it was, but I turned back and I looked. And the man had his head in his hands and he put his lunch to one side. And I was like, well, I've just done a great thing. I've just been doing a sermon at church and, you know, I'm listening to worship music. I'm enjoying it. It's all good. But something drew me to the guy to engage and I walked up to him and I said, hey, I hope you don't mind me asking, are you all right? Which he replied, no, I'm really not. And at first I thought he maybe had a headache because he was kind of doing this. But when he moved his hands away, I could see his face was soaked with tears. He told me about his situation. He'd been in a difficult and abusive uh, relationship. He'd been relocated. Displaced. He said he didn't know anybody, he hasn't got anybody. He said he felt lost. He said a whole lot of stuff was going on in his head and his heart as he looked out at the sea in front of him. And then he said this. He said, you know, today I looked up and I screamed out silently to an empty sky. Because nobody sees, nobody knows, nobody cares. So I invited him just to walk with me uh, along the promenade. And as we walked and talked, as he began to share more and more, I said to him, hey, I don't know if you're spiritual or not, but would you mind if I pray for you? I told him that I worked at a church and so on. And right there and then on the busy promenade, in a very normal, natural way, we just walked and talked and we prayed. And I prayed for him, I said that maybe... Is it maybe the fact that maybe God does see you, that God does know you, 
that God saw you on the bench, that he knew you'd be sitting there at that lunchtime. He knew I was going to be walking past. He knew that the two of us could meet, that the two of us could connect, that you could be seen, that you could be heard, that you could be cared for, that you could be prayed for. And it was a really amazing time. And for me personally, I felt alive in my faith. I felt something of God's pleasure as I engaged in something in the heart of God. It was a real learning curve and lesson for me. I was able to go back and, and connect him with um, organisations and, and charities and people who were set up to help him properly, professionally. People that could uh, go round and actually visit him and look after him and get him back on his feet. I'm glad I stopped. I'm glad I listened. I'm glad I was able on this occasion to engage. But I'm glad I was able to remember the poor because it was in God's heart. It was of God's heart and it was a blessing to me and hopefully to him too. Let's just spend a moment now just bringing ourselves before God. I don't know where you are, but I don't know whether you can put away distractions and you can allow just a moment just to bring yourself. We believe that God is here by his spirit, wherever you are, that he wants to speak. Lord, open our ears that we'd hear you. Teresa, who is part of our counselling team, just on Tuesday was encouraging the staff team during staff prayers to listen to God. She had this quote from Mark Batterson. It says this, God often speaks the loudest when we are the quietest. So let's just allow a moment now and in the day and in the weeks to come to be quiet before God, to speak. Come, Lord Jesus. Maybe you want to put your hands out if you're able to. Come, Lord Jesus, speak to us. What's on your heart? Who am I have missed, Lord God? Help us to remember the poor, Lord Jesus. To have the right heart, the right motive. To join with you in serving. Spirits are rushing with fire of God for within Holy Ghost breathe on us we pray And as we repent turn from sin revival and burst smolder rain breath of God find us into flame Sweet fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit that burn with holy fear, purify in faith and be refine as fire, strengthen what remains. So we the church, bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and king. Prophesy, 
the sigh and sing We can hear the wind blowing, blowing, blowing Move upon our praise, sons and daughters sing We can hear the wind blowing
Well, it's been great to worship with you today and uh, just one thing we want to mention in the life of P's and G's is that our internship program is still open for applications and uh, maybe you're wondering what God's calling you to next maybe you want to discover perhaps what gifts he's given to you maybe you're wondering about uh, what life is like uh, on the staff of a church like P's and G's uh, well, we just encourage you to look at the links uh, page that is being put up now and to check it out on the church website and see if that might be of interest to you or somebody indeed that you know. But as you move forward into the next week, uh, let me pray for each of us as we go into what God has in store for us. Father, thank you that you are light and life and hope. Thank you that your breath lives in us. And that your breath is that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you might breathe your life, your love, your peace and your power into everything that we face this week. And that we might know your blessing, the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit resting upon us, remaining with us and empowering us now and always. Amen.